Good evening. Glad to see everybody here and out of the heat. If you could turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, we will be reading verses 4 through 6. Our topic this evening is the triune God himself. From the perspective of Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, questions 5 and 6. And we will open with Paul's message to the Galatians that redemption and adoption come by way of the three persons. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So reads the word of God. Let us pray. Our perfect, holy God and Father, you are perfect in your triune nature, triune and perfect in joy, triune and perfect in glory, triune and perfect in justice, Lord. And yet we fail to ascertain you all at once, for you are wonderful and fathomless, Lord, but we also fail in our nature. God, we ask that you grant us the privilege this evening that the words spoken are carefully chosen and that the message received is carefully placed, that we may have the most appropriate picture of the thrice holy God. We ask this all in your Son's name. Amen. Please be seated. At large, Galatians is a book written against false teachings and lies against Paul, spread by those who we know in history as Judaizers, those people who teach that the Jewish life and all of its legality must be observed in the Christian life as well. They have made their way into the church at Galatia and are preaching a distorted gospel. As Paul states in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul calls them the circumcision party at the end of verse 12 in chapter 2 because the distorted gospel they are preaching is that justification comes by the observance of the law, including that observation of circumcision, thus giving the outward appearance of a lawkeeper, a Jew. Paul calls them out for what they really are, though, Chapter 6, verse 12, a faithless, fearful people who are scared of the Romans and the Jewish persecutors attacking the Christians. Chapter 6, verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. These teachings of the Judaizers are more than circumcision. For the root of this observance is born from their shortened view of God and his law. They see a singular God, a singular God in essence and a singular God in person. Paul then in our text reminds the saints within the church that they are saved by the actions of a triune God that it is in the actions of three that grace, mercy, forgiveness, and justice can be executed. The monotheistic God, the Father, sent God his Son to pay for a people and God his Spirit to keep and adopt them. Tonight we will be moving through our next set of questions of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, those being questions five and six, which relate to the Trinity and in the single God. Question five, are there more gods than one? Answer, there is but one only, the living and true God. 
And question six, how many persons are there in the Godhead? Answer, there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. The points that we will move through will be these. First, our doctrine, which we'll call the triune God. Second, our implications, named the Trinity to man. And third, our charge, we'll call response to the mystery. Let's begin with our doctrine, the triune God. What is Trinity? Is there a perfect way to describe it? Well, in fact, no, there is not. All illustrations and descriptions of the Trinity have their shortcomings. This is because of the fact that it is in the Trinity that we approach the mystery of God, his unfathomableness, uh, the depths that cannot be searched. And yet, being image bearers of God, who, a God who wants to be known, we are capable, at the very least, of approaching this mystery, recognizing its presence and thus beginning our meditation on its holiness. So then, let's give it our best shot. The well-known expression is this. God is one in essence, three in person. Let's go from the flow of the catechism. Question five, are there more gods than one? Answer, there is but one only, the living and true God. God is singular, alone in power, alone in glory, alone to be worshipped. There are no other gods but He. This is reflective in the most sacred text of the Jewish people, in what is called the Shema, which means hear or attention or listen. We know it as Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This text is sacred for it establishes monotheism as the proper uh, response to a singular God. Kiddos, mono means one. Theism more or less, is the belief of a God. So then, monotheism is the belief in one God. And to be theist is to be sane. And there can only be but one true God who is alive and not a robust system of automations. We've seen that the, one of the unique attributes of God is that he is all-sufficient. That means he has no needs at all. If there was such a thing as a need for God, it is found within himself. He has already met it and supplied it, so to say. We are not sufficient. If I go too long without water, I need water. If I go too long without seeing people, I get lonely and I need communion. And as we have identified, God is a personal God. He is a person who wants a relationship with his people. This personhood, this desire for relation, where is it met? Well, it is already met in the perfectly sufficient God, but with who? The one God is in perfect relation within the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Question six. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God. The same in substance, equal in power and glory. The doctrine of the Trinity, then, makes things both clear by demystifying some items, while at the same time making God all the more mysterious. And when we ever talk about mysteries, we should be 
holding the one in mystery with a wonder. For how can it be that there are three in one? This is where uh, so many false thoughts come from in Jehovah's Witness or Islam. First, allow me to list a few items for what we are not saying the Trinity is. First, try theism. Kiddos, this is where your schooling pays off. Remember mono meaning one? Well, try means three. And the Trinity is not the belief in three gods. That is what tritheism is. If we believed in three distinct divine entities, separate entities, we would be at odds with our text, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. The Lord is one. This itself is nonsense. Because there cannot be but one eternal, infinite God. This is why any religion with more than one true God falls flat on its face. There can only be one. Modalism. Modalism is the belief that God takes different shapes or modes at different times. The only one who is a bigger fan of Transformers than my kids is the man at the stage. <laughs> Transformers, uh, like Transformers, God, in this view, changes his shape based on need and necessity. The Christ on earth was God taking the appearance of flesh while heaven remained vacant. Then Christ ascended and resumed the shape of the Father only to take the shape of the Spirit at Pentecost. Not only is this idea completely blasphemous because it makes God a stage actor, but it denies the personhood of God. If God is one in essence and one in person, then he is a very lonely God who is in dire need. One of the best images for the Trinity is that of the Athanasian shield, if any of you have seen that. A triangle at the points as the names of each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Ghost, Holy Ghost. And each of those names is connected by a strand, a line that makes a triangle, and each is labeled, is not, is not, is not. And the distinction is this, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. And yet in the middle of that triangle, is God, with a strand from each of those names to that, with the label is. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Ghost is God. As great as that image is, you can already see some of the shortcomings of that illustration. For in a same mysterious way, without contradiction, the Father, Son, and Ghost are one and yet separate. The Trinity is then best described in terms of praise. <clears throat> it is God's perfection. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Augustine, says that the Shema is inherently Trinitarian, that the call to love God in a threefold manner is reflective, then, of God's own person. The Trinity is also the height of God's joy. It's what makes him the most happy God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Trinity is what drives him to call all peoples to worship him as the rightful ruler of all. Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. Grace to you and peace from him 
who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before this throne, his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. The Trinity, then, is everything that makes God wonderful, everything that makes him worthy to be praised. It is the height of joy. It is the height of perfection. This brings us to our next point. The implications, then. Trinity to man. What does it mean to us? It should be, as we just saw, the focus of all our attention and love. But how can this be to begin with? Does God not have everything he needs in himself? Does he need anything from us? No. So then ask yourself the age-old question, why did God make you? Not for his sake, but for yours. He made you so that you could gaze upon the majesty of the one God in his triune nature, so that you could firsthand see the love the Father has for his Son, who is eternally begotten, and the Son who loves the Father so perfectly that he obeys his will to the full, and the infinite Spirit, the great Helper, who proceeds from them both. This is the point of creation. This is what gives symphonies its resonance. This is what gives gems its gleam. For your sake, God rose you from dirt to partake in the most wonderful thing that ever has been and ever will be. Who would we be to reject this? We'd be who we are now. We have sinned against the beautiful one. We have sinned in a like fashion to Trinity, to the one and three. What I mean to say is that you can and do sin in unique ways to the persons of the triune God. The atheist, God calls him a fool, Psalm 14, verse 1. But saint, are there not dark times where you live like there is no God? Do you trust in the watchful eye and provision of the Father? The world rejects the Son, the Christ, and chides those who follow him. Certainly, you have not gone out of your way the same way as Peter to publicly reject the Son to the faces of the world. The threat there is far too serious. Matthew chapter 10, verse 33. But whoever denies me before men... I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. But if sin is found in the breaking in the spirit of the law, such as hate is in the heart to the murdering of your brother, then what is the difference in rejecting the Son openly against quietly slinking back into yourself in awkwardness and shame in a public moment? The Spirit, the great helper, he is present and active through every saint. And to not be what gifts he readily brings is sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. These sins, some only able to be perpetrated by the saints, are awful and horrendous. Each one deserves death forever, as justice demands it. And the fact that they are paid for is only due to the fact that there is trinity. If There is salvation from a perfect God, and thank God there is. It is only because he is triune. The catechism cascades so well from point to point. God, as we examined in the previous question, is unmovable, 
unchangeable. He is unchangeable in goodness and justice. He, though love, cannot deny his justice. God's justice cannot and will not be dissuaded or mitigated. <clears throat> because God must give justice, there is then no such thing as merely forgiving sin. He does not lay it aside. He does not put it out of the way and forget about it. Though that is the promise for future saints. He will always pursue each and every sin to its bitter end. There is no escape from this punishment. Forgiveness of sin, rather, is this. It is when a good man comes into the courtroom and will willingly take your place, taking upon himself all of the charges and punishments therein, placing it upon his own head, and the justice being executed by the arm of the good judge. And the while the bailiff, that spiritual person, will give you all that belonged to the good man and keep you so that you may live free, not merely as a free man, but as a free son of that very judge. This is the triune hope that Paul is presenting to the church in Galatia, warding off from the single God, single person, justice and punishment alone that the Judaizers are preaching. They cannot be saved by observing the law. They cannot be saved by a God who is one in essence and one in person, but only by the Trinity. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There is no hope of life in Islam, no peace in Judaism or either of these in any faith where there is but one God who is alone by himself. If there was a point to take away from this, it is this. Justice, grace, mercy, and forgiveness can only, period, be completed by the Trinity. You are saved only because God is three in person. The Father's justice is totally satisfied in the crushing of his Son in your place. And the Spirit with you is that very one that proceeds from God the Father and God the Son that makes you a son and daughter in adoption. That is the Spirit that holds you so tightly, which Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. <clears throat> Let us move to our charges. What is our response and how must we live now that we know the Trinity? Our first charge and the one that most aligns with our purpose is to meditate on the Trinity. It is the point of your creation, to be in endless awe and wonder of the triune God. There is much more to say than any of us could ever fill the pulpit with, and much more than all of eternity can contain. When confronted by the expression, one in essence, three in person, we should be stumped by the mystery, not by confusion. In mystery, we can say, who is like God, mighty and able to save, the one God, the three persons. It should draw out our praise and our worship. If the Trinity is the most dazzling thing ever, we should be drawn to know more of it. We, and the more we know, 
the more we can praise for. Look back through the scriptures now and see if you are reading through the lens of the Trinity. How can a singular God promise to the seed of Adam with no potential worthy sacrifice? Genesis 3.15 and all other scripture at all times, God is speaking in triune nature. Our second charge, our final charge. We must teach and protect this doctrine. Parents, look to your children and ask yourself, am I raising a Trinitarian? Does the Trinity cause your family to sing? Focusing back on the context of Galatians, Paul is at war against the anti-Trinitarian Judaizers. The church stands here today because of the efforts of Paul and the early church. We do not see an end to the Judaizers in Scripture. The the anti-Trinitarian beliefs spread well through the years, and the fighting gets much worse. It nearly splits the church many times over. It is such a grueling war that it is not one but many generations of efforts from the saints. Honestly, the issue against the Trinity has caused so much strife that it consumed the first 400 years of the church uh, to the point where people have died and have schismed. There was no such great battle as that of the Arian heresy. Arius taught that Jesus was the most exalted being ever created, and that God was singular and alone in his personhood. In their view, they thought they were honoring God by keeping him holy, separate from material, separate from anything of the flesh, and keeping him singular, one, that God did have spirit, but it was just the singular God. And this drove them to error. But we live on the post side of these first 400 years. We did not see the growing victory that the Arians felt. This idea grew to such an amount that Alexandria had become almost entirely Arian. This is where the largest group of them congregated. And to signal their teachings to signal their victories and denounce the triune nature of God, they would often mount a hill uh, that rose on the other side of the river in Alexandria. And they would sing, singing of how God is one and one only and that Christ is most certainly not God but creature. But their song would be challenged and ultimately disrupted. For on the opposing side of the river, on an opposing hill, the early church gathered. Teachers and fathers who sang their own battle song right back at the Arians. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and God in heaven, we are in thanks that you have rose us up, lifted our heads and cleansed us off, that we may catch the small glimmering of the rays of your glory, Lord, that you have given us an elder brother in the flesh who sits upon the throne and reigns as one of your wonderful persons, Lord. We ask that you reveal more of your glory, that you reveal more of your person to us so that we may be more aligned with for the, the purpose for which we have ever made, Lord, to worship and enjoy you forever. Make us a people that enjoy the Trinity. Make us a people that enjoy the perfect Father, the perfect Son, and your perfect Holy Spirit, Lord. 
We ask all this in your Son Christ's wonderful name. Amen.